Hello to everyone in Zoom land. Um, just by way of identity check, you can see in this first slide that the person who's speaking to you now is the same person in the picture. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm really thrilled to know that uh, in terms of signing up, I'm told that there are representatives from 30 countries um, on this webinar. And, um, and in multiple, multiple time zones. So whatever time of day it is for you, I, I, I hope you're awake. And more importantly than that, that you're safe and well. I know that these are trying times for all of us. And um, I appreciate everybody who's been able to attend today. Um, I would like to, um, I need, I will like to tell you that um, I am a, an advisor for mobile ODT. Um, and I have to also tell you that it's been a very exciting time to work with them. Um, as you can imagine, uh, and as one of the people who almost 25 years ago brought you VIA, we're really now working in the next dimension of visual assessments of the cervix, as you'll find out in just a little while. But I thought it would be worthwhile to tell you just a little bit about the kinds of things we're going to talk about in the next little while. We'll talk a little bit about epidemiology, developments in screening, advances in treatment, and developments in colposcopy, which will take up probably the majority of our time together. So this, a sign like this, especially for those of you from developing countries, or who remember the days before the pap smear, um, will recognize that cervical cancer is a serious problem. It's one of the top causes of death in women from cancer worldwide, although less so in the so-called developed countries. But this was just a sign that I, that I photographed outside of Kenyatta National Hospital, the premier public hospital in Kenya, which you see in the background here, just representing um, the seriousness of the cervical cancer problem. As you can also see from this slide, cervical cancer worldwide is approaching levels of maternal mortality in terms of the number of women who die annually. And what you can see from this slide, even more importantly, is that in the last number of years, over the last 30 years or so, maternal mortality has decreased by 34%. But cervical cancer mortality has increased by 45%. In great measure, that's partly a result of, or a, a, a connected to the fact that the population of women who are surviving into the age when they can get cervical cancer is increasing worldwide. And I'll show you what I mean by that in just a second but also the fact that lots of money has been put into reduction of maternal mortality, but over the same time period, very little funding has been provided for cervical cancer prevention in particular. And that's a real challenge for us. One of the reasons I was telling you about the population is if you just, if you look at this population pyramid from poor Myanmar, um, you can see that in terms of the number of people in the population, these bars here between 30 and 45 or so represent the current screening ages. And in countries like Myanmar, even with this relatively smaller proportion of the population eligible for screening, they still have only managed to screen maybe 10%, maybe 15% of the population. Whereas the bulk of the population in a country like Myanmar, over 60% of the population is under the age of 25. You can just imagine that in the coming years, we have more and more screening to do, or we'll see the continuing rise in cervical cancer mortality. So that's another challenge that we have in terms of what we call coverage. Now, these concepts that I'm, I'm sharing with you now, such as coverage and, and um, the percent of people that have been screened, 
that's very similar to a lot of the issues that we've all been learning about with COVID in this past year. And I will share with you some similarities that I think cervical cancer prevention and COVID have. But um, moving on, what I wanted to share with you is this concept that cervical cancer prevention and thinking about it has really evolved in the last several years. In the old days, in the 1950s to the 1990s, when the pap smear was the pre premier screening test, um, the, the, the real emphasis programmatically in many places around the world seemed to be about the test itself, creating a better cytologic exam, a better pap smear, et cetera, et cetera. And issues of screening coverage and links to treatment weren't particularly emphasized. But in the recent years, we've recognized that this is really a three-legged stool and that not only is screening coverage really important, but linking screening and treatment is tantamount to program success. You have to have an effective treatment, but if you have a screening program, but no links to treat the treatment, the problem is that screening by itself has no intrinsic preventive value. And so it's very important that screening be linked, especially temporally, that is in closely linked in time to screening. And that's something that I think we've become to realize much more, um, much more seriously in the last few years uh, as, we've, as we've changed the type of screening that we can do. And now we have multiple screening modalities which can help us achieve greater screening coverage. Now, in terms of new screening modalities, I wanna spend a few minutes just talking about HPV testing. As we understand it here in a developing country like the United States, um, this has already been approved as a primary screening approach in the UK and Australia, or if not actually already approved very close to being so, um, and one test is already approved for this in the United States <clears throat> with other companies working toward getting their tests approved for this purpose. So my own view is that in the coming years, <clears throat> we won't be doing cytology nearly to the extent that we have been. In fact, I don't think we'll be doing cytology really at all, but almost all of our screening will be molecular in, in, in its approach. Now this creates a challenge because HPV specificity is only moderate. And I think any of the people that are already, that are familiar with HPV testing will realize that um, there has to be some sort of secondary test placed in between um, HPV testing and something like colposcopy so that we don't uh, undertake a lot of unnecessary invasive procedures such as colposcopies, colposcopies with biopsies, or even treatments based solely on an HPV test, which is not really very specific. So we need to create an intermediate test that will improve specificity without sacrificing, oh, this is a, a typo here, without sacrificing sensitivity. Um, so this is gonna be a challenge for us in the, in the coming years. And one thing that I wanted to um, bring to your attention was a concept that we've begun to develop that relates to PCR testing for HPV. And what you see here is the um, cycle threshold times of, of, of two patients who had PCR testing. One of them had CIN1 by biopsy and the other one had CIN23 by biopsy. And what you can see here is in this PCR test, um, and this, this happens to be the technology of a company called um, Attila Biosystems. The, test, the name of the test is Ampfire. But what you can see here, and this is time or the number of cycles, but it's basically the same as time that it requir the test required in order to come back positive. You can see that in the test where the patient had CIN23, the test turned positive much sooner in only 15 minutes or so, even just right after maybe 12 minutes, it started to turn positive compared to the patient who only had CIN1, where the test only started to turn positive after 20 minutes or so. And one paper has been published about this from a group in South Africa about this concept using a slightly different test and a test that's probably not too practical in programmatic terms, but this 
in terms of new developments gives me and my colleagues a window in which to think about how we can pose an intermediate test or um, a sort of a reflex PCR test in order to winnow down the number of people who are likely to have um, to are likely to have high grade lesions or high grade dysplasia as opposed to low grade dysplasia and probably not need follow up or treatment. The next thing I wanted to bring to your attention is something that's very novel. I don't know if any of you are familiar with this emoji, but this emoji is the emoji for menstrual blood. And my colleagues here at Stanford and I have been working on looking at the potential value of menstrual blood for diagnostic and therapeutic purposes. And if you look at this, um, and we, we actually developed a, a special pad that has a little stick in it here. And once the blood has reached the pad, you just simply remove the stick, send it in the mail because the stick contains a dried blood spot. It's not a hazardous material. And we can run any number of tests from this stick. And I'm just gonna show you here a graph from one of our publications that shows that if you, if you look at the correlation between um, the menstrual blood on the bottom and the serum on the side, you can see that for a variety of tests um, and pay a special attention here to hemoglobin A1C and other things like FSH, HDL, you can see that there's really almost a direct correlation between menstrual blood and what we get out of serum. Now, I can't show you data about this now, but what I can tell you is that we've just completed a study looking at HPV and whether we can collect HPV um, and test for HPV from the sample of menstrual blood on the stick that I just showed you. And sure enough, the correlation between the HPV results from the menstrual blood stick and common uh, HPV tests such as COBAS or um, some of the others um, uh, such as biologics, et cetera, they're basically 100% correlation between 98 and 100% correlation. So testing for HPV um, by menstrual blood may be a, a very interesting approach in the future especially since one of the lessons from COVID is that if you don't have to go to the doctor's office, don't go. Now, the other thing that I wanted to bring to your attention are new concepts in treatment. Now, this is not totally new, but it may be new to some of you. And I know even there are relatively few places in the United States who are, who are using thermal ablation for treatment of precancer of dysplasia. Over the years, this has had another a few names, thermal coagulation, cold coagulation, which never meant, meant made any sense to me because this is electricity, so we always think of it as hot. But it's really an ablative approach similar to that of cryotherapy, but to be blunt, instead of freezing the cervix as we do with cryotherapy, we're boiling the cervix with the, with the diathermy or the thermal ablation. The nice thing about these units, and this is the entire unit here, and what you can't really see here on the, on the very bottom of the picture is that there's a little battery in here, which is the same exact battery that you might use in your home, a battery powered drill or something like that. And it will really, you can literally do dozens and dozens of cases on a single charge of this battery. This treatment takes about one minute to do a double treatment, just like we might do double freeze. And even the double treatment takes about one minute. And uh, the nice thing also, and I'm showing you this probe, I'm highlighting this probe right here, which for this, this company, um, which this particular company is called Medguine, they're the only ones to my knowledge that make a 25 millimeter probe. That means for your more Paris services, um, with a broader diameter, the 75% rule sort of no longer applies because this will cover the entire lesion. And unlike cryotherapy, with this kind of thermal ablation, there's no particular spread. It doesn't keep spreading the way cryotherapy does. So that's a very innovative uh, approach to treatment. And this is a unit that we are now, we are now regularly using at Stanford. 
Another concept that I thought would be very interesting to many of you has to do with just the use of chemicals on the cervix to create basically what we might call a chemical burn uh, for ablation. And in the, the top of this slide here, you see a, a paper that was uh, the results of a project from uh, Austria where they use trichloroacetic acid, which we're all accustomed to using for external warts. They use this for the treatment of both a low grade and high grade dysplasia. And you can see here that their results were really very good in terms of either regression or total remission of the lesions, whether it was a high grade, someplace between 73 and 85% or low grade, 82 to 91%. And what was interesting about their study is even when they tested for HPV, the, um, the HPV disappeared with the treatment of trichloroacetic acid, which you don't often see um, with just ordinary treatments. And this is just a photograph of the, that they took of the cervix. And you can see here, 80 seconds after the treatment with trichloroacetic acid, it looks very similar to a cervix that we might have treated with cryotherapy, um, or thermal ablation. Another treatment that has been proposed, and one publication is out there in humans, is using artemisinin, which is based, or which is a product from an anti, uh, a plant that has anti-malarial properties. And they showed 68% um, success in their first human trial. They were using a vaginal gel or suppository, but for me at least, the downside was that multiple treatments were, were required, whereas with the uh, trichloric acetic acid, only one treatment was required. Well, that brings us to the next phase of this discussion, which is really about colposcopy and advances in colposcopy using a basically a smartphone on steroids in steroids turning the smartphone into what's really a mobile colposcope. And this is the EVA system um, that comes to you from mobile ODT. What's really unique about it is the, the combination of high acuity optics with a very clever and very useful patient portal um, and cloud storage uh, facility. So let's look a little bit more closely at this. This is again, the, the, um, the unit itself. It is Wi-Fi connected. The images, which I'll show you in a few minutes, are very high quality. You can also capture video. The most amazing thing to me, or the most impressive thing, it's really lightweight and, and durable. Um, I would have to say, and I know that I have colleagues and I've actually seen this device being used in Africa. And if you can make something Africa proof, then it's, it's pretty durable. So the most amazing thing, even at my clinic in Stanford is that I can take this device from room to room. I don't need a special room for colposcopy. I just take this from room to room and every room becomes a colposcopy room. Um, the learning curve is pretty quick. Um, my residents have caught on right away. We have nurse practitioners who can use it. Um, you can get actually telecolposcopy, remote consultation services because of the Wi-Fi connection and the portal. And the software and the portal solutions, and this is probably a consideration, especially for the United States, are HIPAA compliant and will uh, are consistent with um, in terms of the clinical record and data management. Uh, let's look a little bit more closely at how this works. So we can we can get a digital image, which is again calibrated, um, and there is an autofocus component to the unit in the most recent software updates. This can be then sent to the cloud for storage in the cloud and can be number one, annotated, which is a big advantage over even the video colposcopes that we have or the, um, the, the old fashioned optical colposcopes. So these images can be annotated with notes so that if a, another colleague goes into the record and sees the, the colposcopic image, they can also see where you took the biopsy, what you thought at the time that you did the exam, and, and this way it can be shared. And you can, you can ask a colleague on another continent, if you like, to look at the image and see what they think and whether they agree with your assessment um, or not. Um, this is just going to show you a, a, one, um, a one photograph here of the captured image. And I, I have to say that with practice, you really can capture a good image just about every time 
Um, and in the autofocus, the image is assessed for a variety of factors and it, factors in including just the presence of the cervix, the quality of the illumination, and um, the device is self-illuminating. Um, let me see if I can, I can show you. Here's one of the devices right here, and there's a light on the bottom. You can sort of now, it's sort of, and I have to get it in the screen here. You can see that there's a light here, which is very bright and perfectly adequate for colposcopic purposes. Um, then the image is assessed to see if it's suitable for actual visual inspection or colposcopic examination. You can also uh, include a green frame. You can put a filter on there to look at abnormal vessels and the usual things for which we use a green frame in colposcopy. Um, so moving, just going to the next phase of this, um, you can see here then that the visual check which is the next, I think, I wonder if I missed a slide here. Let me just check. Yeah, so I wanted to show this slide because this really is for me um, and have coming from, you know, as in 30 years or so on, on beginning with VIA, um, this is really the next big thing. Um, what what uh, mobile ODT calls the visual check. It's basically artificial intelligence or a computer-aided diagnostic tool. Um, and, um, and this evaluates the risk of cervical dysplasia at the point of care. And I'll show you some slides of this in a second. You get the results in no more than 60 seconds. And having worked with the system myself, it usually doesn't take more than about 20 seconds to ask the system to evaluate your, your cervix and then uh, to, to get an answer from the system. Um, so let's just take a little, a little closer look to see what this, what this really can look like. Uh, let's go ahead and you can see here the way it works is, um, oops, I'm gonna go back a slide. You can see that the way it works is that the visual check compares the images captured in an exam with thousands of images annotated by experts in which they predict how they would classify the image. Um, so you have the digital colposcopic image here calibrated, it's uploaded to the cloud, the AI or the visual check is run either on the, in the portal or on an app and the result received in about 60 seconds. And let's just take a look at an example. So here's an example of a cervix that was viewed with the visual check system. And, um, and then you can see here that, well, I can see that there's an area that if, if I were looking at this, I would consider this questionable and probably an abnormal. And when we look to see what the system said without any input from me, it said it's abnormal, which tells the clinician, yeah, there's something going on here. And um, uh, the, the, the system, indicates, yes, this might be a good place to biopsy, um, or this is an abnormal uh, this is an abnormal exam. And by the way, the, the system, the algorithm of this um, artificial intelligence is actually calibrated to recognize what the artificial, the machine thinks is CIN2 or greater. So when I was telling you before that we're trying to avoid non-specific tests leading to um, unnecessary procedures, this is an example of that because the, the algorithm is, care, is calibrated to recognize what it thinks will be CIN2 or, or greater. Let's look at another one. So here's another example of a cervix, something going on here, maybe something going on here. If I, you know, I sort of, if I ask the computer what it thinks, again, it tells me it's abnormal. Here's a cervix where, again, by my view, nothing wrong with the cervix, very nice looking cervix, healthy. Um, and when we ask the system top five answers on the board, it says it's normal. And again, that's, uh, that's characteristic of how the artificial intelligence works to assess just in screening terms, yes, no, biopsy, no biopsy. Um, and in my own view of colposcopy, my view is, with, with you know, 40 years of experience, colposcopy itself is inherently dichotomous. Yes or no? Do I or don't I? Does she or doesn't she? Um, and in the very end, 
that's what colposcopy helps us do is decide, do we think there's a lesion? Do we do a biopsy? Do we don't, we, or do we not do a biopsy, et cetera? Just in terms of validation, it's worth noting here that when these images, um, in terms of the thousands of images that are available in the, in the bank, so to speak, have been compared with providers from Poland, Korea, or India, or for example, myself, um, there is a relatively high level of agreement. You know, anytime you can get three out of four doctors to agree, almost 80% of the time, you're doing very well uh, in terms of agreement between the AI classification and the clinical experts' impressions of, of in both high and low resource settings as to whether we think that there was a lesion there and whether the machine thought there was a lesion there. So this kind of clinical validation is very useful and very important because as you can see here, the level of validation is really very high. So again, um, if you look at the classifier, it was trained on images from 17 countries, um, including India, but you can see in the previous slide that even though Poland and South Korea weren't including in the original classifier or the images on which the machine was trained, the, the examiners from Poland and Korea, for example, had the same level of agreement as the, as the providers from India, where the trainer, what the machine was using Indian images to train itself. Now, just before we finish this part of the program, I just wanted to share with you some thoughts about the similarities between COVID and cervical cancer. All of us have been living through a very a difficult time. But over this last year, I've had time to reflect on the similarities I see between COVID and, and cervical cancer. And so, for example, when you look at the tests there at issue, well, over the years, there's been a lot of discussion about which cervical cancer tests should we use, VIA, pap smears, HPV, should it be DNA hybrid capture or RNA uh, PCR type testing? Um, these have been discussions we've all been having. With COVID, it's been a very similar discussion for those of you who have been following this, whether you should use antigen tests, which are like pregnancy tests and look for proteins um, that can be um, easily extracted onto a, a, on a test strip like a pregnancy test versus PCR. And this discussion has been ranging in the literature for, for this last year or so. <clears throat> what about vaccines? When the cervical cancer vaccine first came out, there was a lot of distrust, concern about side effects. Would, would this lead to promiscuity? And that the fact that the vaccination was different than the vaccination program. And we've seen the exact same thing evolving for COVID. Now, and, and as, you, as I touched on at the very beginning of this talk, coverage issues are the supreme issues with respect to both preventing cervical cancer and uh, mitigating the spread of COVID. There are treatments for both, um, but the, the big difference is that, um, you know, if you're exposed to HPV, it may take you 10 years to get cervical cancer. If you're exposed to COVID, it may be 10 days. So we have to do everything a little faster. So in conclusion, for this part of the talk, um, I wanted to tell you that, again, cervical cancer is... Um, uh, that these prevention paradigms will be radically changing in the coming years. Molecular technologies will be increasingly important and alternative sampling approaches such as self-swab, maybe menstrual blood will replace conventional approaches such as clinician obtained uh, pap smears. I believe that mobile ODT technologies will play an important role in these transitions. So I wanted to now um, share with you just some demons. I wanted to demonstrate some of the capabilities of the system, both as I myself have experienced and has, have, has others. So this just shows you the kind of setup we happen to use in my setting. Here's the, the uh, mobile ODT unit, and it happens to be perched here on a what we call a monopod, which I use because it's extremely portable. I can actually put this in my backpack. I can take it from clinic to clinic. Um, we have a very handy uh, carrying pouch for the EVA system, the mobile ODT device itself. So this is just an example of 
of the the way that we've been using the the, the unit at my uh, clinic. I know that Mobile ODT has other stands and devices which it's which it which it will send to um, uh, users and purchasers. But this just happens to be the one we use because it's very portable for us, and we go to different clinics. The other thing that I wanted to that I like about the monopod system is that it gives you a lot of working room. I know this looks like giant claws coming at you, but but it gives you, um, it's very easy to work around the monopod. So that if you're if you're manipulating the cervix while looking looking at the screen, you don't get the the stand itself doesn't get in your way. Here's a typical readout, or this is a typical the the typical workflow of the screen itself. And I can, for example, I can enter the patient ID, um, various different aspects of her care, her HIV status, what the pap smear result showed, her HPV status. And then when I go to do the exam, I just wanted to show you a few pictures from my own clinic in terms of the quality of the images. So here you can see a cervix at relatively low magnification, but you know, good enough for most purposes. But here I've outlined an area of mosaicism here, which they then on zoomed in um, on here and which you can see quite clearly. But my point, and I wanted to share with you that these are not images actually seen through the, 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 the lens itself. These are images that I, I took a photo of the screen. And so the image on the screen itself is actually a little better. Here's another one where you can see um, a, an area of concern here and another image where I'm using the annotation feature. So we saw something at the very bottom of this cervix is probably HPV related disease, <laughs> excuse me, but we annotated that we could, um, that we could uh, took a biopsy there or that we, we wanted to maybe notate that it was a little bit away from the squama columnar junction, which you can see right here. Another image showing that you can use both Lugol's and, um, and acetic acid with mobile ODT. So here's a cervix of some concern here, <coughs> excuse me. And you can see that the Lugol solution exactly mirrored, I uh, highlighted um, the area of acetyl white here with the so-called saffron colored lesion here, it's clearly visible through the device. And this is a scary one. So this is actually an adenocarcinoma that was poking through the cervix. This is again, a, a patient of ours. Um, and you can see um, how clearly we could see this lesion here. Here's the cervical os with lots of mucus, but this adenocarcinoma was coming in from the, coming out on the surface of the cervix from the outside. And here's just another, a close up of it. Again, this is a, a shot of the actual screen, not what you see through the lens. And finally, um, one of our clinicians at Stanford is very interested in anal HPV. And this is just an example of, um, of the EVA system being used for anoscopy, both a sort of low power view and then a much higher power view. And again, so for those of you who are interested in anoscopy or HPV in, in the anus, it's an equally valid tool for this purpose. Um, I wanted to show you an example of the readout that you get. So if I were to go through the entire workflow, the beginnings of which I showed you a minute ago, um, I can send it to the cloud and then the cloud will formulate a templated report for me, which shows everything that I entered into the system, the cervix visibility, whether I could see the SCJ, vascular changes, acetyl white changes, all these kinds of things are entered into the report where I took a biopsy, for example. And then I can also keep the images, these are just sample images into the system so that I have a record here. And then the example will be that the, um, I can, if I had annotated the images, these would also be in the report. And then the, the report gives me a set of, a final assessment usually as to what I thought in terms of high grade, low grade, no disease, et cetera. Now in the last couple of minutes that we have, um, and I know this has been pretty rapid fire, I'm gonna show you a short video which highlights still some of the other features, which I think a lot of clinicians, even some of my own colleagues at Stanford don't actually recognize um, when I sometimes look at their images or they complain to me, how do, you, how do you get this thing in focus? So I'm gonna share with you this video 
to let you see what really happens here. And um, so this is just this this is just showing you how you can enter um, information into this into the system, um, and it uh, you can add the the current problem, what the Pap smear was, etc. Now this one here is important because I'm oops I'm going to go back just a little bit um, right there. So this shows you on the tip of the lens that there's actually a um, a, a rotating a focus device that allows you, um, and I, I think Matan is showing you this device live into your very home or office, but this, this little circular device, you actually rotate once the, once the um, unit is in place in front of the speculum. And actually, you, and, and in terms of how far should you place it, you place it as far as you would have ordinarily placed a colposcope. But once it's placed and you have a view of the cervix, then you rotate this dial and it actually activates a, a fine tuned focus. Um, so in the next photograph here, you can see um, the sort of the, the, the clinician here getting things ready. You can see this sort of angle. So it's looking down onto the cervix and this is meant to show you um, what the, the appropriate angle is with looking at the cervix um, and not too far away. You know, it's like um, Papa bear, baby bear, mama bear, just right. Um, so you get to the right distance in terms of the focal length. And then um, you can see in this next picture, the person actually rotating the lens so that you'll see the, the image coming into focus here in, this, in these sets of images here. And again, you can magnify the image um, on the screen. You can see at the bottom here, I can add a green filter if I want. And, um, and then um, as you as you move through your exam, you can also see that you can um, you can eventually, I'm just waiting, yeah, you can see that you can take a picture. Now I want to I want to show that again because a lot of people will tend to touch the screen where it says camera and and touch the screen in order to take a picture. But that will almost always produce some kind of little shake in the camera. So very cleverly, the technicians here have added a feature where you just wave your hand, you know, just wave your hand in front of the in front of the camera, the backside of the camera, and it will take the. Oops, I, I just started over by mistake. Sorry about that. Let me go back. Um, it will take the picture for you of the of the cervix without having to take touch the camera itself. So that's just showing you again how that works. That's a very handy feature that a lot of people just don't know about. And this is the part of the camera that allows you to do that. Um, now, if you're moving on through this video, you can, again, you can take the green filter on and off, then you can annotate the picture, you can record your, your results, whether you did a biopsy or not, et cetera, and you can further mark it there. Um, you add your impression at the end of the visit, the exam is saved, and then you, you can export it to your email or to the cloud. So with that, I wanted to thank you for your attention. 